Hello, I'm Father Anthony Chicada. 2016 continues as a year for heated public controversy among traditionalists over the question of the Pope. It's Saint Vicantus like me, who maintain the Holy See is vacant, against trads who hold the R and R position, that one can recognize Paul VI and his successors as true popes, but resist all their teachings, all their laws, and all their liturgical prescriptions. In previous videos, I've tackled two ancient R and R tribal myths, the infallible stamp myth and the bad dad myth. By applying these during the 50 years since Vatican II, R and R has made every man his own Pope who can do his own daily review of what a Pope teaches or decrees and heed or ignore it as he pleases. In this video, I will deal with yet another R and R myth, the supposed bitter fruits of Sedevacantism. That is, that a lot of internal disagreements have existed within the Sede camp, and this somehow disproves its arguments. This has long been a favorite accusation from the premier R&R brand organization, Bishop Fillet's Society of St. Pius X. Indeed, His Excellency's latest anti state of Acontis marketing team, John Salsa and Robert Sisko, portray the bitter fruits argument as the death blow against Sedevacantism. Conflicts prove Sedevacantism is, quote, from the devil and not of God. To this I say, what planet are you from? You might as well say exactly the same thing about the whole church, the whole traditionalist movement, and indeed about your masters, the Society of St. Pius X. The root of the problem in each of these cases has always remained the same. Where there is no one to exercise effective hierarchical authority among Catholics, sooner or later, there will be what you call infighting, division, deception, detraction, condemnation, name-calling, and other inhumane behavior, whether there are wicked Sedevacantists present or not. So I'm going to give you a little sampler of some fruit outside the Sedevacantist orchard. Clear your palates and get your taste buds ready. Traditional Catholics have often drawn parallels between their own situation after Vatican II and that of Catholics in England after the Protestant Revolt, at least as regards the liturgical changes and our feeling that we were outcasts, persecuted for the faith. The situation of our forebears, though, was far more disheartening because practicing the Catholic faith was forbidden by law. Priests who tried to minister to their suffering co-religionists were either slaughtered by the horrible practice of hanging, drawing, and quartering, or imprisoned like a group of diocesan priests held in Wisbeach Castle around the year 1600. Here are the names of these heroes of the faith affixed to a letter they wrote to Pope Clement VIII from prison. Surely, you would think, it was a ringing affirmation of the sweetness of Catholic unity in England when faced with persecution or even death. Well, you would think wrong. It was in fact a 12-page letter attacking their fellow Catholic priests in England. A diocesan priest, Father George Blackwell, and of course, the Jesuits. This included the Jesuit superior, Father Garnet, who would be martyred for the faith in 1606. The divisions were acute and continued for a long time because practically speaking, it was Sede Vacante. Sure, there was a real Pope in Rome, 
but he could not exercise his authority effectively on a local level. So Catholics fell to fighting. So the conflict continued for at least a century and a half. One Catholic bishop in England complained to Rome about being, quote, at the mercy of the plots of the heretics and the harassing Jesuits. In another incident, to accommodate Catholics willing to risk making a pilgrimage to the Holy Well of St. Winifred in Flintshire, the Jesuits set up a secret mass center nearby at the Star Inn. When the diocesan clergy heard about it, they set up a rival secret mass center of their own, a mile away at the Cross Keys. Sounds awful familiar, doesn't it? Human nature remains the same. Another example from church history will perhaps underline the point. Along my path to the priesthood, I joined an ultra-conservative monastic order called the Cistercians. Founded in France in 1098, they played an important role not only in church history, spirituality, and monastic renewal, but also in the European economy, land management, and especially land reclamation. In France in the 17th century, the order became bitterly divided over what was known as the War of the Observances. One faction of monks, known as the Abstinence, or the Strict Observance, wanted to introduce complete abstinence from flesh meats. The other faction, known as the Ancients, or the Common Observance, wanted to make use of the indults that occasionally permitted monks to eat meat. And so the monks on both sides went at it, with pamphlets, civil lawsuits, appeals to the king, purging abstinence in one monastery, locking out the ancients from another, and in one case leading 30 armed men to retake a monastery where the opposing monks had barricaded themselves inside. Once again, in effect, it was Sede Vacante, because the king would not allow the pope to intervene effectively. Here is a summary from a Cistercian historian. Nearly all of its capable leaders were drawn into a consuming yet barren fight for power. The best minds of three successive generations spent more time in planning legal strategy than in meditation, used up a greater amount of paper in writing defamatory pamphlets than works of edification, spent longer hours sitting before court benches than in choir stalls. The men who helped to shape the destiny of the reform were fighting children of a fighting century. When they preferred force to persuasion, legal justice to charity, defiance to obedience, they fell into the same temptation that victimized most of their contemporaries in similar circumstances. They were all activated by the unshaken conviction that anything less than battling with unflagging pertinacity to the last would amount to a shameful betrayal of a holy cause. So, diocesan and Jesuit priests fighting over the pastoral apostolate to the persecuted in England, and Cistercian monks fighting over abstinence in France. Infighting, division, deception, detraction, condemnations, name-calling, and other inhumane behavior, as Messrs. Salsa and Sisko would call it. Proof that English Catholicism and Cistercian monasticism are, like Sedevacantism, purveyors of a rotten and wicked fruit? Or merely proof that those who make such idiotic arguments against Sedevacantism are ignorant of history? If you go down to the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bird that ever they also show themselves ignorant about the history of the U.S. traditionalist movement in general. How would Messrs. Salsa and Cisco and their SSPX masters rate the non Sedevacantist produce from this orchard? What's the score on their bitter fruit index? Will they pucker up for non-Sade's too? 
let's give them a few samples, not to denigrate the traditionalists we mentioned, but merely to show that conflict, unfortunate though it may have been, was always widespread among traditionalists of every description. Father Gomar de Pau founded the first U.S. traditionalist organization in 1965. He predated Archbishop Lefebvre. He predated everyone. I remember, as a 14-year-old kid, watching a TV interview where Father de Pau condemned the very first of the liturgical changes. His decades-long career, though, was one conflict after another. He drove off and publicly denounced every priest who tried to work with him, including his own brother. Father Lawrence Bray, an early traditionalist hero from Milwaukee, spent years condemning priests who offered the old mass publicly or who performed marriages or baptisms without delegation from local pastors. Father James Wathen, the author of the widely read study on the new mass, The Great Sacrilege, did public battle with Father Lawrence Bray, Dr. Julio Pro, Hugo Maria Kellner, and others over the legitimacy of the Shikshini, Pennsylvania Knights of Malta. Two factions of the traditionalist knights brought suit against each other over the control of their organization. St. Athanasius Chapel in Vienna, Virginia, became the scene of a public dispute over the ordination credentials of a priest hired by the lay board. The lay-controlled St. Jude Shrine in Stafford, Texas, hired and fired various traditionalist priests at will. Father Hugh Wish and Father Conrad Altenbach, both priests of the Milwaukee Archdiocese whom I knew personally, fought over the issue of whether one could celebrate Mass in a church where the Novus Ordo was also offered. Father Wish was given walking papers from the lay board of his first traditionalist group because they claimed he was violating canon law by conferring baptisms and witnessing marriages. The remnant itself was founded in 1967 as a result of an acrimonious dispute over the Vatican II changes between Alphonse Matt Sr. and remnant founder Walter Matt, changes which, according to the remnant's website, quote, set brother against brother, parent against child, Catholic journalist against Catholic journalist. The Orthodox Roman Catholic movement, founded in 1973 by Father Francis E. Fenton, disintegrated in 1981, when the priests and laymen involved fell to fighting over whether a Catholic should belong to the John Birch Society. Members of a lay-controlled chapel in the Middle West engaged in a lengthy dispute over whether to continue to use the services of a priest who was a child molester. And of course, alas, there is much, much more. The conflicts were as bitter as they come, and the language often positively toxic. The only difference is that in those pre-internet days, the word of these disputes did not get around as far and as fast as it would have today. Uh, but if the fruit falls from a tree in the non sative Vacanta side of the orchard, will Messrs. Salsa and Cisco and SSPX ever condemn it as bitter? To the woods today, you show the big surprise. If you go down to the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bird that ever the Society of St. Pius X's first seminary, where I studied, stands in the middle of a vineyard on the south side of a valley in Econ, Switzerland. The grapes get little sunlight, so the wine they produced was acidic, gassy, and immature much like some of the fighting professors on the faculty at the time. The idea that anyone associated in any way with the Society of St. Pius X, even flax like Messrs. Salsa and Sisko, would criticize Sede Vacantists 
for infighting, division, deception, detraction, condemnations, name calling, and other inhumane behavior, as they have it, makes me want to throw back my head and laugh. When it comes to bitter fruit in the traditionalist movement, SSBX is like Welch's. They've been mass producing the same product for as long as anyone can remember, and you can find it anywhere. But the SSPX grape brand, instead of Concord, would be Discord. Here is a harvest of only some of the bitter fruits from the SSPX orchards. First, a highly symbolic picture of Archbishop Lefebvre blessing the cornerstone for the Acone Seminary. Three of the clerics in the picture were liberals and ended up offering the Novus Ordo, or the Indult Mass, but not before participating in several of the internal SSPX battles I'll be mentioning. The seminarian with the crozier would become the society's longest surviving liberal. There were at least seven disputes over the new Mass and the new sacraments, including the provisions in the original statutes for Novus Ordo style concelebration, reprimands for seminarians who did not assist at the Novus Ordo during vacation. I got one of these. I was denounced by the sister of modernist theologian Hans King and the major internal 1977-1978 battle over whether the Novus Ordo was intrinsically evil. I count 10 SSPX seminary crises that I know of. There were the 1975 departures after the suppression of the society by the Vatican, and the now little-known departure of Father Anthony Ward from the American seminary in 1976. A big one occurred after my ordination in 1977, when the rector, Canon Berto, that's him in the center, and several of the liberal professors quit. The priest next to him is Father Paul Olanier, one of the first priests ordained by Archbishop Lefebvre. He left SSPX in 2006 to join an indult organization. Standing next to the archbishop is Father Sanborn, who, as one of the nine, of course, would get the axe in 1983. Father Gerard de Laurier, a hardliner, was expelled the same year. In 1982, Father Williamson was sent to the Ridgefield Seminary to enforce the pro-JP2, pro-reconciliation party line, and announced to the students that, quote, strife is normal in a seminary. After the 1988 Episcopal consecration, a large contingent of SSPX priests and seminarians left to form the Fraternity of St. Peter. Here's my classmate, Father Joseph Biesik, with JP2. The same year, there was a departure of hardliners from the SSPX Argentine Seminary. Then, in the 1990s, there was the crisis precipitated by Father Carlos Uritigoiti, who created a weird personality cult around himself at the Winona Seminary, with the tacit approval of Bishop Williamson. His followers spurned statues and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Before his first Mass in Chicago, it is said, Uritigoiti invited his adepts to a secret Seder meal. None of these and other oddities prompted his dismissal, however, only the discovery that he was planning to found his own group. He and his followers then departed Winona for the Diocese of Scranton. Here are eight mass expulsions of SSPX priests and departures of religious orders that had started out in the SSPX orbit. The most recent, of course, is the resistance group, that departed after the debacle of Bishop Fillet's negotiations with Ratzinger. Here is a list of six SSPX internal liturgical controversies over the Paul VI changes, the John XXIII rubrics, the pre-55 liturgy, and SSPX's hybrid liturgical practices. And here is a 1982 letter from Archbishop Lefebvre to Ratzinger, 
doing a sellout of the pre-55 liturgy as a negotiating point. And here's an additional 17 SSPX disputes, beginning in America. Fights over the John Birch Society, Old Catholic Chicken Farmers at St. Mary's, Kelly v. Bolduc, the Bolduc mortgage foreclosure attempt, Schmidtberger's accusation of mental illness against Father Bolduc, and Father Bolduc blowing the whole St. Mary's fire settlement. Then back to Europe, a diaconal punch-out over private revelations, the condemned Cape Crusaders of TFP, Archbishop Lefebvre's pro- and anti sadi statements, and the cherry on top, Archbishop Lefebvre threatening to quit at the 1982 general chapter unless it elected Father Schmidtberger his successor. Welcome to democracy, SSPX style. Then a final grab bag of disputes. The endless nutty Williamson provocations, zigzags over property control, Lefebvre's on-again, off-again Vatican Accord, and of course the three bishops against Bishop Fillet over the proposed Rome deal. Finally, here is a document that SSPX produced during the course of our litigation with them in 1983. It is the Society's own list of priests who left their organization, or were expelled from it, from the time of its foundation until 1983. It contains 44 names, 44 priests, most of whom were involved in the internal disputes we have mentioned, and which occurred during the first 13 years of the Society's existence. How many names would be on an accurate list of the priestly departures and expulsions that occurred during all the society's crises and disputes since then. With nearly a half century long harvest of bitter fruits like these, SSPX and its two lay migrant workers, seniors Sansa and Cisco, should lay off Seda Vacantists and tend to their own marmalade. Because today's the day the teddy bears have the The SSPX and R and R camps claim, therefore, that the supposed bitter fruits of sedevacantism somehow defeat its theological arguments, is founded on ignorance of history and hypocrisy. It is a fact of church life and history that wherever hierarchical authority cannot be effectively exercised on a local level, Catholics have a tendency to fall into disagreements and fighting. English Catholics, Cistercian monks, and proto-traditionalists alike, all are capable of both heroism and contention. So to SSPXers we say, spare us all your shock, please. And spare us your hypocrisy. We've served you up about four dozen helpings of bitter fruit from your own orchard. Believe me, there's lots, lots more still on the ground. So the next time you treat some Sadie Vacantis like a baby by telling him a fairy tale about bitter fruit, don't be surprised if he just smiles and says, look who's talking. <laughs> if you go down to the woods today, you show the big surprise. If you go down to the woods today, you better go